Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Welcome to another exciting episode of Hardware to Save a Planet. I'm really happy today to get to sit down with Carlos Araque, CEO of Quaze Energy. We'll be talking about tapping into geothermal energy, which theoretically has sufficient scale to be full replacement of fossil fuels, but really hasn't gotten much attention relative to some other renewables. I'm excited to learn from Carlos why that is and why we should start paying attention now. I'm going to let him introduce himself, but before I do that, I will say that from what I've learned about Carlos so far is that he is exactly the kind of person giving me hope about the future of our planet. He has that rare combination of an aspirational vision for making the world a better place and the technical chops from his time at MIT and as an engineer in the oil and gas industry to lead a team through all the steps to realize that vision. So welcome, Carlos. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dylan. That was an incredible introduction. So thank you very much for that. I'm flattered. <laughs> glad to be here. Glad to tell you about geothermal and glad to share my views on why we need to do these things. These things are very hard, but we need to do them as a species. And, and now is the time to do them. Awesome. Before we get into Quays, I was hoping to learn a little bit more about your journey to climate tech personally. I know you were born in Colombia and then studied mechanical engineering at MIT. Is there anything from that sort of pre-MIT period of your life that inspired you down the path you're on now? You know, when I look back at my upbringing in Colombia, indeed, I was born in, in Medellin. And interestingly, when I think of my own carbon footprint in my upbringing, it's almost, it's very low. It's almost zero. How is that? Well, a lot of our energy in that area of Colombia where I'm from is that it actually comes from a hydroelectric, a massive hydroelectric power plant. We had a solar thermal in the roof of our apartment. It was pretty standard. So our hot water was always coming from solar. And I think all of those things connect backwards, but not forwards. You know, none of that brought me to where I am today. But engineering and my passion for engineering and building things is what brought me to where I am today. I left Colombia at the age of 19 to study engineering at MIT. I went there as an undergrad to do mechanical engineering. I also did a master's. And then I took off to work in the oil and gas industry. I work in Houston, Norway, and England, mostly in the technology side of oil and gas. A company called Schlumberger, so less focused on the actual operation of oil fields and more focused on the technologies that it takes to make oil and gas possible. I held a 15-year career with them. I'm a mechanical engineer, but of course, you have to learn many, many things. After a while, you become a little bit of an electrical engineer, a little bit of a physicist, a little bit of a mathematician, whatever it takes to really understand what it takes to bring together all of these disciplines. So that was my journey into engineering, into energy. Quays is something that happens afterwards when I decide, almost at 40 years old, that the energy transition is the biggest challenge and opportunity of our generation, maybe of many generations. So that critical thinking led me to start seeking a way out of oil and gas and seeking my way into something as big as oil and gas to repower civilization. I'm really curious, of all the renewable energy sources, how did you settle on geothermal? So a little bit opportunistically and a little bit through using quantitative thinking, a very quantitative thought process. So let's talk about the first part first, the opportunistic. When I left oil and gas, I thought that I was convinced, and I still am convinced, that we didn't have the solutions to make energy transition possible as a species. Wind, solar batteries will play a role. The current renewables will play a role, but we fundamentally don't have enough to make it happen. So I was questioning myself, what does it take to push an agenda, which includes a significant technological component outside of a large corporation? Because when I look around, no large corporation is actually working on those technologies that I thought could make it possible. So I narrowed down on venture capital. I figure venture capital, especially the tough tech or hard technology venture capital, is the only pool of capital, aside from grants and government programs, that would actually make something like this possible. It's the only place where you can capitalize a company large enough 
to deploy, to start the commercial journey. Let's not talk about deployment at scale, but start the commercial journey. So that's one. I moved from oil and gas into venture capital to learn that world. And that's where opportunistically, Paul Wasco from MIT came to me and said, hey, I have this idea. I've been working on this thing for 10 years, and I think we can drill much deeper to unlock geothermal, right? So that's where the meaning of the minds came together. The second part is the quantitative part. You know, as an engineer, it's almost like, why do I say that we don't have the technology to transition energy? Well, it boils down to numbers. How much does it take? How much energy does it take to power civilization today in the 21st century? It takes about 20 to 25 terawatts. Doesn't matter where it comes from. Most of it comes from fossil, but I don't care about that. I just care that that's an important number. And it doubles every 25 years. It's been doubling for 200 years. So I don't find any reason to believe that it's going to stop doubling in the next 25, unless something really bad happens. So that nails down the core challenge. You know, we need to come up with anywhere from 40 to 50 terawatts of energy, hopefully carbon-free energy by 2050, and probably two, three, four, five times as much by 2100. So when you look at those things quantitatively like that, you start realizing, okay, what could possibly do it? And you land in only three places. And there's really three technologies, so three sources of energy that can actually scale to those levels. The first one is nuclear fission, geopolitically very sensitive. So if it doesn't scale, it's for those reasons. Fusion is what the sun does. We still don't know how to do that as humans, but it can certainly scale to that. And deep geothermal, which is the last untapped renewable. It's tapped marginally. Everything else, wind, solar, hydroelectric, um, tidal, wave, it all won't scale to those levels. And we can talk about the details at length, but that's really how you land into those things. What is it, maybe put into perspective, why solar and wind aren't appropriate? There's been so much energy put into those sources. Is there just not enough land? There's certainly enough sun. (laughs) There's certainly enough sun, for sure. (laughs) So it it boils down to three quantities. Number one, the land intensity per unit of energy for wind and solar is 100 to 1,000 times larger than it is for fossil fuels. Today, we operate mostly with fossil fuels. About 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. All energy, not just electricity, which means that replacing every single watt or terawatt will claim a premium on land of 100 to 1,000 X. Is that a problem? It is not a problem at one gigawatt or even 100 gigawatts, but it is a problem at the 30 to 40 terawatt level. It's too much. I mean, the ecological consequences of deploying at that scale are just as bad as carbon in the atmosphere. So land intensity is one. Material intensity, same argument. Per unit of energy, the amount of materials, pick your material, could be cement, could be steel, could be copper, could be nickel. Per unit of energy, wind and solar take up anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 times more than fossil fuels of those materials. And sure enough, you hear it today. Mining is going to boom. We don't have enough materials to do this stuff. Maybe we do, but we need to really ramp up mining. So again, is it a problem? Yes. At the tens of terawatts, it is a problem. At the one gigawatt, it's not a problem. And the third one is the labor intensity. That has more to do with geopolitics and how much of the species actually gets involved in procuring our energy. To give you an example, if you go back to the beginning of civilization, the big invention of agriculture allowed less humans to spend time procuring their food, and that liberated humans to do other things, right? And here we are going backwards with respect to energy. We're going to involve involve many more humans procuring our energy simply because the labor intensity per unit of energy is much more. And we're still talking about hundreds to a thousand times more. So I think those three things will combine to not make it possible. I don't, I I mean, we'll deploy at great scales and there's plenty of growth to be had in wind and solar. Don't get me wrong. We'll see plenty over the next 10 to 20 years. But if we do just that, we're going to see in 2040 looking back and say, oh my God, we're we're barely scratching the surface, right? So that's why I say that we need to do things that really have the muscle to go to attack those three quantities, labor intensity, land intensity, and material intensity in a fundamentally different way. Okay. So can you give us kind of a just geothermal 101, beginner's guide to geothermal on energy generation? So the resource itself is thermal energy in the earth. So if you think of the planet itself, it's hot. It's very hot inside. 
it's as hot in the nucleus as the surface of the sun. So this energy, this thermal energy that's stored in the planet, is a thermal battery the size of a planet. That thermal energy is there from two sources. The first one is the original accretion of the planet when it came together through gravitational bombardment. And the second one is radioactive decay in the crust, in the materials that are inside the planet. So it is really a heat engine that's slowly cooling down. It's been cooling down for billions of years, and it will continue to cool down for billions of years. It cools down at the rate of 40 terawatts, right? That's twice as much as we use today as humans, just by itself, right? So regardless of whether we tap into the resource or not, it's already cooling down like that. And the best estimates will tell us that the sun will stop shining before the earth fully cools down. Fusion will run out before the geothermal energy in the planet runs out because they cool down at very different rates. The, the sun shines at a much higher rate. So that's the resource. You know, we're talking about a planet-sized thermal battery. The amount of energy there is, for all intents and purposes, infinite. Now, we don't have access to all that heat. We have access to only the heat that's close to us. And in some places, that's pretty close to us. Some places, you have hot springs, you have a hot water running as rivers, and that's what humans have historically used. In places like Kenya, you get 50% of your energy, electricity from geothermal. In Iceland, you get about 30%. Some countries are very keen on that because it's easy for them to do it. But it only takes drilling a little bit deeper. And by a little bit, I really mean a little bit, right? The planet is 6,000 kilometers thick, right? The radius of the planet is 6,000 kilometers. We're talking about really 3 to 12 miles or uh, 5 to 20 kilometers. That's a very small fraction of a percent of the size of the planet. But if we could do that, you start getting, you start making every place on earth as a prolific with geothermal energy as Iceland or Kenya or the typical places that you see with that. Now, so geothermal today is mostly in those places where it's easy. Geothermal tomorrow is where we will make it possible through a technological advance. Can you explain what Quay's Energy's innovation is in accomplishing that? Yeah, glad to do that. So it is the closest you've ever been to infinite clean energy, no matter how you put it. It's like a, a trip to the grocery store in some places, right? It is, there's no way to get inf- access to clean, infinite clean energy and then only three to 12 miles, right? So that's another way to spin this. It is very close, but it is hard to get there. So what Quase is doing, what the innovation, the innovation comes from the MIT Plasma Science Fusion Center. And there's a good reason for that. They repurpose fusion ideas, ideas used for fusion reactors to make a drilling system which is driven by electromagnetic energy. So I'll start explaining a few of the attributes. So the first, how we do this is we are going to use the oil and gas industry to drill conventionally using existing technologies through the first portion of the earth, right? They are the masters at drilling in sedimentary rock. They do that really well. It's regulated, and there's a lot of geohazards. They know how to do that. I know that. I used to work in that industry. That's what they do for a living. So the first portion, we drill conventionally, and that could mean one mile, maybe two, maybe three, depending on where you are. But sure enough, at those depths of two to three miles, you're going to hit the basement rock. So the basement rock is below, and there we're going to do things a little bit differently. So now, instead of rotating a drill bit to grind the rock, we're going to inject two things into the hole through a pipe, pipe that looks just like oil pipe. We're going to inject millimeter waves. Millimeter waves are like microwaves from your oven, right? There's nothing special to them other than the fact that we can make them very efficiently using machines invented with infusion called gyrotrons. So we are going to inject the millimeter waves into the pipe, and we're going to inject a gas into the pipe. The two things go down through the pipe to the bottom of the hole. The millimeter waves exit the pipe and vaporize the rock. They literally heat the rock and vaporize it. And the gas that we inject to the pipe is then going to pick up those vapors and blow them out of the hole. So there's ideas here from two worlds, ideas from fusion and ideas from oil and gas. From fusion, you have the concept of gyrotrons. You have the concept of transferring an electromagnetic beam over a pipe, metallic pipe, over very long distances. That's exactly what they need to do for a fusion reactor. From oil and gas, you have the concept of direct circulation of a gas to remove material. So that's it. You basically, with those two concepts together, you've just made a drilling system that lacks 
drill bits, it lacks electronics, it lacks fancy sensors. And because it lacks those, its chances of surviving those environments is exponentially greater. Actually, you gave me some great visuals of this stuff some before our recording, and now I will put those up in the show notes if we can, so people can kind of visualize it. But just quickly, maybe just for scale, what kind of diameter of hole are we talking about here? To me, when I think of the size of the system we're designing, it will have to, and it will, look like the size of an oil and gas operation. So we're talking about eight-inch diameter holes, like a basketball. We're talking about a holes that are vertical, and they're not all 20 kilometers deep. 20 kilometer deep is the extreme range in those places where the geothermal gradient is very low. But in many places, three kilometers is enough. In others, four and then five. So that's what we're talking about. Each of those wells is capable of producing anywhere from 50 to 100 megawatts of thermal energy. So that's a huge departure. To put that into perspective, that looks like an oil and gas well. And oil and gas well produces that kind of power in the form of oil or gas. We are producing in the form of supercritical or supercritical water. And to compare with other geothermal, we're talking about 10 times to 100 times more energy per well than the shallower types of geothermal. We're talking about holes that are consistent with drill rig capabilities, that fleet of drill rigs available in the world today. We're not going to ask the oil industry to have to come up with brand new drilling rigs to be able to hold the pipe for that distance. So very, very matched to what exists in the world today in terms of drilling rig, drilling technologies, handling capabilities, and very importantly, and I always talk about this, the ability to use the steam at the heat rates and at the grade necessary to repower a power plant. You know, there's 10,000 fossil fire power plants in the world today. What if we could repower them with the steam as opposed to retiring them and creating all brand new infrastructure with wind and solar, for example. So we really design around what the world has today and how do we actually plug and play into that world. You're effectively replacing the energy source that all these fossil-based power plants are using today, but all the downstream infrastructure is still usable for generating electricity. Very much so. I mean, it's we got to move fast. So there's 10,000 power plants and they produce mostly two-thirds of the electricity we consume in the world today. And I think repowering them is such a beautiful opportunity if you can fit the steam to them. And you're right. The only part about a power plant that's problematic is the boiler that's burning the fossil fuel to make the steam. Uh But if you could get the steam to the same grade from the ground, that takes care of everything, right? That basically eliminates a very small fraction of the infrastructure of the boiler and keeps the other 90% of the infrastructure intact to repower. So that's a foundational idea. And, and even if we don't repower a power plant, we build a new power plant if necessary, right? If you go to a place where there's not a power plant, you build it. But the important thing is that there's plenty of, there's a whole industry in the world today, which has taken almost a century to create, that is in the business of building power plants. So again, even if we have to build a power plant, you are pulling on those industries that are already made. There's workforces, there's supply chains, there's regulatory frameworks already in place. I don't think we can afford to ignore 100 years of fossil energy development just like that if a solution as simple as that can come forward. We talk about it being an infinite source. Is there an infinite source of energy at each drilling site or can you kind of deplete the heat in that local area? So nothing's infinite. Not even solar is infinite, right? The sun will eventually die. Right. But for geothermal, the type of geothermal we're, we're bringing forward, well, you normally design the site to produce at the design point that you design it for, for 30 to 50 years. Those are the typical depreciation schedules for these assets. So it means that after that time, there will be thermal drawdown. The rock down there will get colder. And by colder, I'm talking about five degrees colder, five to 10 degrees colder. I'm not talking about chilling the rock. That's not possible. So then you're off the design point. At that point, your steam is no longer what's optimal for the power plant. So that may force you to move away from using that steam as an electric generation source and maybe use it for other uses, or that may require you to move to another site. If you move to the north, to the south, to the east, or to the west by, let's say, a mile, you have fresh new rock there where you can replicate the process 
and have another 50 to 100 years. And you can do this no matter where you are. Now, what happens to the one you left behind is that in another 50 to 100 years, if, you were, if, if we allow ourselves as humans to think that long, which capitalism doesn't allow us to do, um, you could go back to that one and it would be refreshed because heat keeps emanating from the center of the earth and it continues to hit that rock back up to what it was before. So arguably, you could go back in 100 years and you have an asset to go back. Now, we capitalism doesn't know what to do with 100 years, but this is what's going to happen. And, and sure enough, you see it in many places. There are still thermal power sites that have been going around for decades, if not 100 years, and they still keep giving, keep giving, and keep giving. So actually repurposing those power generation plants is a big part of the story. What does that look like? Is there competition for that resource as those get retired from fossil-based energy production or... Yeah, the space, when I look at the competition for the power plant, what I see is two trends. The first one is repurposing the grid interconnection and the land available to the power plant. You know, So the argument goes like this, hey, let's put a solar park or a wind farm in the vicinity of the power plant because you already have a grid interconnect and we can simply go in there very easily, right? Transmission continues to become one of the bottlenecks as we scale renewables because they're so diffuse, so dispersed that you have to build a lot of transmission for them. Uh, people also say things like, let's put thermal generation batteries or batteries, very large battery banks, co-located with the power plant. So they're really looking to repurpose a very small portion of the power plant's assets, the grid interconnection and the land. The other camp, the energy sources that have the hump to actually repower the power plant, the turbine, the, you know, I mentioned three, and sure enough, the other two are also aiming to do the same. When you look at fission or fusion, you hear them talking about what if we put a small fission or fusion reactor to feed steam to the turbine rather than from the boiler, which is the same idea we're promoting. So those are the two camps. That's the competition. It will boil down to whose steam is cheaper, including gas. The steam coming from gas will have a role to play because uh, economics play a role. But I think that's how you think about it. Now, I think that repurposing only the grid interconnect is wasteful. I think it's much more elegant and efficient to repurpose the full asset rather than just the grid interconnect. And I want to be clear with these people, when they think of coal power plants or gas power plants, they imagine these 70-year-old old things that need to be put down anyway. Not at all. I mean, there's hundreds of power plants being built in the world brand new today. Maybe not in the United States, but but you see, those are going to be around for the next 40, 50, 60 years. Those are the ones that represent a risk to the energy transition and the ones we want to use capitalistic forces through this technology to actually reconvert. So that's how we think about it. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be there. And if we don't repower them, they're going to be spewing CO2 for the next for the rest of our lifetimes, really. I'm curious about scale a little bit here. So I imagine that replacing terawatts of fossil-based energy is a massive undertaking. Can you help me put that into perspective? How many wells are we talking about drilling? How many power plants are we converting? Yeah, so a terawatt. How much is a terawatt, right? A terawatt is the total electric consumption of the United States today. So that's the scale we're talking about. And the, the United States is the, arguably the, the biggest consumer of energy in the world, maybe very closely followed by China. So that's a terawatt. Another point. So wind and solar today combine are close to a terawatt. They're a little bit over a terawatt these days. I think it's 1.2 terawatts. So the total deployment of wind and solar over the last three decades, everywhere in the world, is just coming up to a terawatt. So that's a terawatt. So what does it mean? Oh, and a third point, the only industry with a proven track record to put a terawatt of new energy into the mix every year is, guess who? The oil and gas industry, right? When oil fields deplete, they produce less and less. And the world still sucks up, depending on the year, anywhere from 80 to 100 million barrels per day. So how does the oil industry keep up that production when all of the oil fields are depleting? Well, they have to put up more new capacity. New capacity. And when you add that up, it's roughly a terawatt. So every year, the oil industry has to drill and put online enough wells to close a one terawatt gap. And they've been doing it since the 60s or 70s, right? So that is the only industry. So that's the scale of a terawatt. Now, when we translate that to what we're doing in geothermal, I mentioned before, let's just think quantitatively as engineering in order of magnitude. So 
this may get technical for some of the audience, but I want to follow this process. So at a well, we'll give you 100 megawatts. 100 megawatts is 10 to the 8 watts, 10 to the power of 8. A terawatt is 10 to the power of 12, right? Giga, tera. From 10 to the power of 8 to 10 to the power of 12, there's four orders of magnitude. That's 10,000. So you need 10,000 wells per year. That's it. That's a terawatt, roughly speaking. 10,000 wells. Is that too much or is that too little? Let's look at historical figures. How many wells has the oil and gas industrial on average over the last 10 years on an annual basis? Between 30 to 50,000 wells per year in the United States alone. Right? So the oil and gas industry, and I, I always stress this because these scales are important. You know, replicating these scales takes centuries. It's taken a century for this industry to emerge with the size that it has today. So we're talking about 10,000 wells, of which the oil and gas industry is capable of doing 50,000 on a good year, 30,000 on a bad year in the United States alone. So it is within the capabilities, and it is these are different wells. They're deeper. That's where the technology comes in, but otherwise they're the same. Same mobilization, same logistics, same infrastructure scale. So that's basically the best way I can put it. That's what a terawatt looks like, and the world will run on 50 of those by 2050, right? So these numbers really put into perspective the scale of the challenge, and we, we don't think in numbers like this. If we don't think quantitatively, we're going to fail. We're not going to transition energy. That means we're going to have 50% plus of the mix being provided by fossil fuels in 2050. And sure enough, every extrapolation, every pathway put out there by any major think tank institution predicts precisely that that we're going to be at maybe 50 to 70% mix of fossil fuels by 2050. Doesn't sound like a success, especially when we're looking at 1.5 degrees Celsius. So cannot emphasize enough how we need to elevate our thinking to this level to actually come up, we roll up our sleeves and come up with the right solutions. Hmm. So I'd love to talk about the tech at least a little layer deeper. I know millimeter wave is not a new technology. It's used in radar and communications and things like that. What have been the challenges in adapting it for drilling like this? So yeah, millimeter waves are used extensively for decades now in communications and ranging radar. When you go through the airport, there's millimeter wave machines that scan you. When you hold your 5G, then the next generation phones, there, there will be millimeter wave phones. So it's really just the electromagnetic spectrum that's very interesting to use. What's Change in the last 20 years, and what MIT, this is MIT's contribution uh, to realize this, is number one, when you're talking about very high power millimeter wave sources, we're talking about a megawatt of power. We're not talking about powering your cell phone with a cell tower, but a megawatt of power to vaporize the rock. The gyrotrons, which emerged in the 1950s as a tool for fusion research, have matured to the point where you can actually buy them from many suppliers around the world. The ITER experiment, the fusion experiment in, in the south of France, ordered 24 of them just recently from different suppliers, and they deliver. So the gyrotron is number one. They exist, they're robust, they've been maturing for the last 70 years to make the millimeter wave so to become a millimeter wave source at one megawatt level as possible. Number two, the science behind piping all this energy inside a, a metallic pipe has also been evolving. Now, when you initiate a plasma, you have the hydrogen in the plasma chamber, the deuterium and the tritium, and then you have the millimeter wave source far from it. So you have to get the energy from one point to the other. And you do that through waveguides. So waveguides have been evolving and maturing. The science behind them has been evolving to the point where you can carry all of this power. We're borrowing that idea too. And the third one is simply the fact that the world truly does need to win a fossil fuels. If you remove that condition, we just keep burning fossil fuels. So I, I think all of those three things converge to make it technically possible and to make it necessary from an economic point of view. So that's what's new. That's why this makes sense now. Now, they spent 10 years proving that the science actually works. So we didn't step into this company just with the idea like that. We had a 10-year program of research, which had fundamentally established that you can burn rock with millimeter waves very efficiently, that you can transport this energy, and that you can make usable holes. Paul Waskov did a lot of that. Now, going forward, the challenges are about scaling, right? It's very different to do something on a benchtop scale with tens of kilowatts available to you from doing it in the field where you have a full operation, which has to be regulated and permitted. The safety plays a huge role, and you're working with megawatt sources. 
So that's what we as a company think of as our biggest challenges going forward, scaling that operation to a field operation, not a lab operation, and then demonstrate that we still have enough control over the process to do it at every increase in depth. That's all in front of us. And today we find ourselves straddling the intersection between the academic lab, we're out of that, into a national lab, we're in there, into the field, which is what comes next for us. How hot is it down at the bottom of these wells? You, you said you're getting super critical temperatures. So the short answer is 300 to 500 degrees Celsius or 600 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, at those high temperatures, you just double. There's no complication with the 32 set. You're an engineer. <laughs> yeah. So that's the short answer. But the true answer is that we want the steam to repower a power plant. So you start thinking about the power plant first. What's the turbine? inlet specification, what steam temperature and what steam pressure does it want to operate optimally? And then you backtrack from that to design the geothermal field to provide that. That, for most power plants in the world, that translates to the 300 to 500 degrees Celsius at the rock that I mentioned. And that's how we think about them. So we're not always drilling 20 kilometers and 500 degrees Celsius. We drill what we have to drill to feed the turbine what it wants, what it needs. And that roughly translates into 300 to 500 degrees Celsius and three to 12 miles universally, globally speaking, for this planet, right? So that's how we we think about that. Now, how do we remove the heat? How do we extract the heat? The heat is there. There's zero uncertainty about that. So unlike oil and gas, where there is a resource uncertainty, there's such thing as drilling a dry well and losing all your money because you can't get a single drop of oil out of that well. The concept doesn't exist here. There's always going to be heat. And to interrupt you, that does exist with traditional geothermal, right? That's something I've heard is that- It does exist. There is a lot of sort of drilling exploration when you're not able to go as deep as Quays is able to go. Yes, and the reason it exists is because today, almost 100% of the geothermal that exists in the world today is hydrothermal. So it's looking for hot water in place. So you could not hit the water. You could hit, you could miss the aquifer by a hundred meters. If you missed it, then that's a dry well. You have to sink the cost. But we're not going for the aquifer in place because at those depths, it's very unlikely that aquifers will exist. We're simply looking for the hot rock. And the hot rock is always, there's no such thing as missing the hot rock by a hundred meters. It is impossible. It's everywhere. There is such thing as maybe having to drill 100 more meters to get to the temperature you wanted. That's relatively small compared to the bigger scheme of things. So to extract the heat, you need to circulate the water. You need to get the water in contact with the rock. The water we put into the hole, you got to get it in contact with the rock. The rock itself, you need a heat exchanger. And that can take a variety of forms. The simplest one is that I will introduce a concept from geology, which is universally accepted. The crust of the earth is critically stressed and therefore fractured everywhere. So there's no such thing as solid granite or basalt in the basement, which is without fractures. It's always fractured. So in many places, those fractures have enough permeability to allow you to circulate water through them. If you put a hole in one spot and a hole in another spot, in between them you have this rock and there's enough permeability for water to move forward and sweep the heat away from the rock. That's one. The second possibility is that, yes, the permeability is there, the fractures are there, but it's too low. You need to enhance it. So you need to apply about a 500 to 1,000 PSI additional pressure from the lithostatic to open them up, and then you prop them open. This sounds and looks like a fracturing operation in oil and gas, but it is quite different when you actually execute it because you're in a very different geological setting. Now, it's not easy to do, and there's a lot of research going on in the world to do this, not least the the, the FORGE experiment by the Department of Energy in Utah. Look it up, for example, or look up the Japan Vision Brittle Project in Japan, right? Or the IDDP in Iceland. All of these people are trying to enhance those processes. But in that process, you enhance the permeability That then allows you to sweep the heat away. In a third embodiment, you don't need enough heat rates. Let's say you're not trying to repower a power plant. You're trying to simply feed some 
hot water to an industrial process or to an agricultural process that requires a lot less heat per well than a power plant would. So you may get away with a closed loop system, which means you don't actually fracture into the rock. You simply circulate the fluid in and out. Best examples of companies like these are Ever, Green Fire, and a few others that are doing that. So those are different schemes depending on the use that you have for the heat. I do believe that, again, when we talk about terawatt scales, you need to fracture the rock. You don't need to fracture the rock. The rock's fracture. You need to enhance and open up those fractures and prop them open so that you're creating enough permeability to get the heat rates that you want. So that's how you extract the heat. And they call this an enhanced or engineered geothermal system. The idea goes back to the 70s, and it's been successfully carried out in some places and unsuccessfully carried out in other places. So let's not diminish that part of the problem. It is almost or equally as hard and as important as the drilling part of the problem. But that's how you would do it. The the drilling gives you access to the heat and the fracturing or enhanced geothermal system, EGS approach, would give you access to the surface area to then produce the heat for a long time at the rates that you want. And that's effectively done by pressurizing the hole. There's two mechanisms. In oil and gas, it's mostly through pressurizing. You actually pressurize and pressure alone is the mechanism that gives you the permeability enhancement. But in geothermal, Temperature plays a significant role too. The best analogy of that is what happens to a block of ice when you throw it into water. It cracks, it fractures because of the thermal shock. When you're in that deep rock at those temperatures, you basically quench it, you shock it. I'm not talking about freezing it. I'm talking about dropping it from 500 degrees C to 300 degrees C very quickly. That goes, that, that creates a fracture network, which then when you apply pressure, will extend. And then you can repeat this process. This happens in oil and gas, by the way, where people are producing oil and gas from too hot a well, and we're talking about 170 to 200 degrees Celsius. There is a concern of fracture in the rock because the mud is too cold. So now imagine the rock is not 200, but 400 or 500. This is certainly going to happen. And that plays a big role in the fracture process. So it's more a thermally and pressure-driven process than simply a pressure-driven process like it's in oil and gas. Mm-hmm. So this is an important aspect that I hadn't realized before, but there are two hole, two drilled holes, one to input the cold water and one to take out, and then that water transfers through the fractures and the, your heat exchanger, and then a second hole to take the hot water out or the supercritical water out. Yeah, in fact, you need one to inject and to produce because the water changes density significantly on the way in and out. Okay. When you inject, it's close to a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, the density. And when you produce it, it's close to a third, a half to a third of that. So you need more room on the way out than on the way in. So normally the minimum set is three wells, one injector, two producers, and you repeat that arrangement. That arrangement will give you anywhere from 100 to 200 megawatts of thermal energy. And you'll repeat that arrangement as many times as necessary to get the heat rates that you want. If you're trying to get a one gigawatt power plant going, well, you'll need to repeat that arrangement five, six, seven times. But we're talking about dozens of wells, you see. We're not talking about hundreds or thousands of wells. We're talking about repowering most power plants with dozens of wells, which is a piece of cake for oil and gas. You ask oil and gas to drill 100 wells, they'll do it in their sleep. If you ask them to drill 12, they get bored, right? So this is the importance of scale. Dozens of wells per plant. Per plant, per plant. Mm -hmm. So thinking about kind of the future of Quays and the geothermal energy production space, where do you hope Quays Energy will be in 10 years? Okay, so we are still in the lab. We're still transitioning from the lab into the field over the next three years. My aspiration is that we'll convert the first power plant this decade, right? So 10 years is too short a time frame for these kinds of companies. And, and it's not unique to this company. All major technological undertakings take a long time, 10, 15 years to mature. So in 10 years, I'll be very happy if we have success with one, two, maybe five power plants, and then it's slowly establishing itself as something that's financeable at scale and something that the oil and gas industry can do at scale. So the true value of what we're doing doesn't really make a difference in the 2020s, but it makes all the difference in the 2030s and 40s. 
In fact, I think that it is the only thing that actually makes a difference in the 40s and 50s, in the 30s and 40s. A few closing questions. So, and we touched on this a little bit, but how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of our planet and why? I get anxiety about these things as a human. Forget about me as Quays or as an engineer. I have kids, 13, 16, and 21. So they're not babies, but they're not too old, right? So they're going to have these issues in their lives. So it belongs in our generation to solve this problem. And when I look at history, I don't think we face quite this challenge as a species, but we face very daunting challenges in the technology and the knowledge we had at the time. So I see repeatedly in history that we've been able to overcome, but we need to focus on the right things. So I see very much myself as an optimist and as one of my key missions in life to put in front of the world the fact that these kinds of things are not optional, they're absolutely necessary, and that we have to support them and make them happen. Because if we don't, we're not going to succeed. And I'm very vested in our success as a species. So I'm optimistic, but I think there's a lot of awareness to be had. And I talk on behalf of fusion and fission as well, because I think that those are the only other things that can actually move the needle enough to make a difference, right? So these things need to happen, not because they're nice, because they're cool, because they make money, but because I don't think there's any other options. And I don't want to be pessimistic about wind and solar. I think they play a role, but they just don't play at the scale of the problem. Well said. Who is one other person or company doing something to address climate change right now that's inspiring you? So they all fall in that space. I mean, so here I have to be a little bit more diverse. So I've been talking about primary energy supply, right? And that's when I think there's only three ways to do it. But certainly that's not all that needs to happen. There's carriers of energy and there's demand of energy, right? It serves as we don't succeed if we procure all the energy we can from clean sources if we don't have demand centers to consume that clean energy, right? So when we talk about demand or the carriers, there's brilliant companies. Everybody doing it direct or capture, I think that's a necessity. We have to do that at any cost. That's a necessity. If we put in more than a trillion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, we got to take it back. So that's non-negotiable. On the demand centers, electrification of transportation plays a big role. Electrification of industry plays a big role. I won't name specific names there. On the primary supply side, which is where I find my camp more at home because that's the part that I'm trying to solve with Quays, I love what the fusion companies are doing. And very specifically, I love what Commonwealth Fusion Systems is doing. They've elevated the dialogue and the ambition to the level that's required. And I think there's still a lot of pushback about fusion is going to get, it's going to take another 50 years. We cannot afford not to do things like fusion, right? So kudos to that team, Bob, the CEO, because these things have to happen. They're non-negotiable to me. And these humans that undertake that mission, that awareness, elevating the dialogue to that, they belong in history, right? So absolutely close to that. Awesome. Thanks for calling them out. I've taken a look and it looks like they've raised a good chunk of cash. So, it, so maybe some investors are seeing the same opportunity. <laughs> a lot of cash, $2 billion or more. <laughs> <laughs> What advice do you have for someone not working in climate tech today who wants to do something to help? Don't be shy about the understanding, undertaking, understanding the complexity and the scales of these things. We shy away from quantitative thinking. Not everybody does, but in general, we tend to shy away from quantitative and complex thinking. But I think this is what this problem is about. So my aspiration is that people looking at wanting to do something about climate they don't get contempt with just the little things, but they actually develop a good understanding of the size of the problem and then make a critical judgment for themselves, given that understanding of the size, where they can actually make a difference. I think if more aspiring people, more aspiring engineers, scientists, economists, et cetera, we think at that level, we start realizing, we start playing the game at the right level. My concern is that I think there's still a lot of lack of awareness of the size of the challenge. And we think that doing little things is going to help. It will, but it will help so little that it doesn't make a difference, right? So I won't call out things here because I don't want to be critical with the work that humans do. It's all important, but I want to call attention to that. Think about the size of the problem and form a critical opinion for yourself about how you can actually make a difference. 
Well, thank you for that. I think you've done an excellent job of demonstrating that way of thinking today. So I have to say I've learned a lot and I really appreciate the time you've spent with me and everything you're doing to address climate change. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity for speaking out these ideas. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.